The night before the intercession, Moscow was terrified. The Cossacks of Hetman Sahaya Dakni stood in front of the city and were preparing for a decisive assault. Together with them, the troops of the great Hetman of Lithuania Jan Karol Kodkevich were preparing for battle. That day, history could have gone the other way. The Romanovs would have remained a fleeting episode. For example, such as the Godunovs, and the throne of Muscovy would be occupied by the legitimate ruler, the Polish King Vladislav. Hello, my name is Vladlan Muraev, and you are on the channel History Without Myths, where we talk about the past without embellishments and falsifications. Exclusively for the Day of Defender of Ukraine, we will tell you about Sergei Adekny's campaign in Moscow. To begin with, a few words about the hero of our story. Pyotr Konishevich Sergei Adekny is usually depicted as a respectable elderly man over 60 years old. But the fact is that the real date of his birth is unknown, and almost all portraits were painted two to three hundred or even more years after his death, respectively, they are the creative imagination of artists. The only authentic image of Pyotr Konishevich Sagayadekny is in the book by Kasian Sakovich, which is entitled Poems for the Mournful Funeral of the Noble Knight Pyotr Konishevich Sagayadekny. This portrait very generally conveys the facial features of the hetman, and it is impossible to establish his age behind the portrait. Some historians claim that at the end of his life Sahaya Dakni should have been somewhere over 70 years old. But recently, Doctor of Historical Sciences, leading researcher of the Institute of Ukrainian History of the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine Petro Sos argued in his publication that the most probable year of birth of Sahaya Dakni is 1582. Accordingly, at the time of the Moscow campaign, the hetman was only 36 years old, not an old man even by the standards of that time. And in total he lived about 40 years. Only fragmentary information has been preserved about the origin of Sahaya Dakni. According to Kasian Sakovich, the future commander was born in the west of Ukraine in an Orthodox family. He was born in the suburbs near the mountains, he was brought up in the faith of the Eastern Church from an early age, then he went to study in Ostrog where science flourished, thanks to pious princes who were fond of science and founded schools so that young people could learn and be useful for the church and the motherland. This passage is about the famous Ostro Academy, founded by Prince Konstantin Vasil Ostrogsky, a famous patron of Ukrainian, or, as they said then, Russian, Ruthenian culture. Wow, the Ukrainian language of the 17th century. So, after completing his studies at the Ostro Academy, Petro Konishevich joined the Zaporoshan army, where he was nicknamed Sahaya Dakni for his archery skills, married the noblewoman Anastasia Povshinskaya. The couple had a son named Lukas, who studied at the Zamoyska Academy in the Polish city of Zamostia. By the way, in the metrics of this educational institution, the guy was recorded as Lukash Petri Konishevich, and this once again proves that Sagayadekny is the very nickname of the hetman, which only then later began to be perceived as a second and integral part of his surname, and now even supplanted his first surname Konishevich, which in turn comes from the name of his father, Konan or Konash. In his youth, Pyotr Konishevich Sahaya Dakni participated in military campaigns in Moldova, Wallachia, Livonia, as well as in land and sea campaigns on the Tatar-Turkish coast of the Black Sea. The military victories of Sergei Adekni did not go unnoticed by the Zaporoshan society, and in the 1616th year during the sea campaign on Kaffa, now this city of Feodosia in the Crimea, Sergei Adekni was obviously entrusted with the hetman's mace for the first time. The sprawling characteristic of the hetman was created by his contemporary and a man who knew Sergei Adekny very well, Yakub Sobieski, by the way, the father of the future ruler of the Commonwealth, Jan III Sobieski. This Pyotr Konishevich is a man of rare courage and maturity and judgment, inventive in words and deeds, although he was a simple man by origin, lifestyle and habits, fate always especially favored him, he always returned covered with glory, he was a man of great spirit, who sought danger, disregarded life, was the first in battle, and the last in retreat. In the camp he was watchful, 
he slept little and was not given to drunkenness as is usual among Cossacks, but he served Venus restlessly, and this hastened his death, at meetings, sober or drunk, but he was careful, and in all conversations he was very quiet. This characteristic, he served Venus indefatigably, indicates Sagayadekni's boundless passion for sexual pleasures, and allows us to look at the hetman from a very unexpected side. Although it must be said that Mikhail Grushevsky very chastely noted in his history of Ukraine Rus that this message causes a certain distrust. But why, the titan of Ukrainian historical thought never explained. So, then, in the 1610th year, the Moscow junta, the so-called the Seven Boyars, recognized Władysław Vaza, a Polish-Swedish king of Austrian origin and at the same time the son of the ruler of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, Sigismund III, as king. However, he never came to Moscow. And on the 3rd of March, 1613th year, the Zemsky Sabor chose Mikhail Fedorovich Romanov as Tsar. The new autocrat was very young, he was 16 years old, it is clear that he was inexperienced, and in addition, according to the apt expression of the Russian historian, Vasily Klyuchevsky, he was distinguished by mental and physical weakness. Accordingly, he was completely dependent on the will of the boyars, and therefore King Vladislav reasonably hoped to win back the Moscow crown from him. In the fall of 1617, the army of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth again marched on Moscow and approached Vyazma, where it encamped and waited for reinforcements. But there were no reinforcements, and many Poles simply began to leave the camp. Who did Vladislav ask for help then? Of course, in the Zaporizhia army. But Sahaya Dakni proved to be a real diplomat. He now understood that the services of the Cossacks were extremely necessary for the Poles, and accordingly offered his terms. Then relations between the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and the Cossacks were regulated under the Vilshansky Agreement signed in the autumn of 1617th year near the city of Tarashka. According to the agreement, the Cossack register was only 1,000 people, they had the right to choose their hetman, but this agreement was not approved by the same, although there were already tens of thousands of Cossacks in Zaporozhye. So, Sahaya Dakni put forward the following demands for his part. Firstly, to increase the Cossack register, secondly, to expand the Cossack territory, and thirdly, to restore the Orthodox hierarchy in the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which was banned under the Brest Church Union, or rather replaced by the Greek Catholic hierarchy. Władysław, his father Sigismund III and even the Polish Senate agreed to such demands, so the Cossacks began to prepare for the campaign. They decided not to connect with the Polish army near Vyazma, but to go straight to Moscow through Pitevil. In the summer of 1618th year, 20,000 Cossacks with 17 light guns went to Moscow. By the way, the right hand of Hetman Sahaya Dakni in this campaign was Mikhail Doroshenko, also the future Hetman, who was then first mentioned in historical sources. A significant advantage of the Cossacks, compared to the Polish army, was their mobility. Within a few weeks, they captured Ryalsk, Livny, Yelets, Lebedyan, Dankov, Ryesk, Skopin. That is, these are cities that belong to the modern Kursk, Ryul, Lipetsk, Ryazan regions of the Russian Federation. Cossacks burned homes, robbed local residents, spreading panic among the Moscovites everywhere. South of Moscow, near Sierpikov, Ukrainian Cossacks met the Moscow army under the command of Prince Dmitry Pashersky, by the way, the same one who is considered the savior of Moscow in the 1612th year, and to whom a monument was erected on Red Square. By the way, this is the first sculptural monument in Moscow, the author of which is the Ukrainian Ivan Martos, a native of the city of Iknia. However, Prince Pashersky allegedly suddenly fell ill and did not appear for the battle. He was replaced by Prince Gregory Volkonsky, who received an order not to let the Cossacks into the city of Kolomna, but as soon as the Muscovites saw the Cossacks, they began to flee, according to the local chronicler, they were gripped by irresistible horror. At the end of September, 1618th year, the Cossacks stood already under the walls of Moscow near the Don Monastery, by the way, now it is almost the center of the Russian capital, not far from the Garden Ring. 
Tsar Mikhail Romanov sent an army against them under the command of Voivode Vasily Buturlin. This is a relative of that Boyar Buturlin, who will then come to Bogdan Kamelnytsky for the Pereyaslav Council. The Ukrainian and Moscow troops lined up against each other near the Don Monastery, and according to a long tradition, both commanders began hurts. In other words, they began a duel. This fight is evidenced by the above-mentioned Yakub Sobieski. Sagayadekny himself snatched a spear from Buturlin and, approaching, struck him with the mace that he received from the king, and knocked him off his horse. Sahayadakni, being the hetman of the Zaporoshan army, in this expedition fully showed his remarkable courage. The duel ended with a complete victory of the Cossack military leader over the Moscow one, by the way, this is another indirect evidence that in those years Sagayadekny was not an elderly person, but rather young. Vasily Buturlin survived only thanks to his protective armor. In Tushino, in the northwest of Moscow, where the camp of Dmitry Ivanovich, false Dmitry II, once stood, the Cossacks joined with the Polish army and, as an eyewitness to the events wrote, the Polish nobleman Stanislav Kovavitsky. In extremely difficult circumstances, this unexpected, as if sent from heaven, help, filled the souls of all with extraordinary joy. During the audience with King Vladislav, Sahayadakni handed over to him the captured commandants, as well as the intercepted Moscow ambassadors who were on their way to the Crimean Khan Janibek Jurai. Muscovites were ready for such a desperate step, despite the fact that the Crimean Tatars had recently captured and burned Moscow. Meanwhile, separate Cossack units raided Moscow territory, captured the cities of Kashira and Kasimov. The Polish Cossack army approached the very walls of Moscow, and, as the Russian historian Serhii Solovyov testifies, the terror of Muscovites was increased by a comet that stood over the city itself, the king and all the people considered it a harbinger of the fact that King Vladislav would take Moscow. And even the Don army refused to help Mikhail Romanov. The Don Cossacks considered themselves a separate state and refused to obey the Moscow Tsar. On the contrary, they decided to support Vladislav. And here is the culmination and at the same time the most mysterious episode of the whole campaign, on the 1st of October according to the Julian calendar, the intercession was celebrated, taking into account the 10-day difference between the old and the new style for the 17th century, this is October 11th of the year 1618 according to the Gregorian calendar, which we use now. Three hours before dawn, the assault on Moscow began. Poles and Cossacks managed to reach the Arbat Gate. Now the Arbatsky Vorota Square is located at this place, from where the Kremlin walls are only a little more than 800 meters, but then the attack stopped. Polish officer Bartholomew Novodvorsky, by the way, isn't he a distant ancestor of the Russian oppositionist Valeria Novodvorsky? Had already planted explosives under the Arbat Gate, but was wounded in the arm by a musket and retreated. The attack was repulsed, the Cossacks and Poles retreated and again camped in the vicinity of Moscow. Probably, each of you has heard the story about how the Ukrainian Cossacks allegedly stopped because of the bells of the Moscow churches, and they decided not to fight against their Orthodox brothers. Even I heard this story when I was in school, I wondered where this version came from and who invented it. As it turned out, the author of this theory is Mihailo Maksimovich a Ukrainian scientist of the 19th century, the first rector of Kyiv University, well, that is if you don't consider Volodymyr Tsyke. So, Maksimovich 170 years ago wrote. Sahaya Dakni's Cossack heart might have been troubled by the thought that he had begun to plunder the capital, which professed the same faith as himself, in order to deliver it into the hands of another faith, and perhaps such thoughts came to him when the resounding in Moscow bells, summoning the Orthodox people to an early service on the Feast of the Intercession, and the Cossacks, who were besieging Moscow, involuntarily threatened the Orthodox faith. At that very hour, the virtuous hetman, having already fulfilled his vassal duty by taking smaller cities and storming the capital itself, could leave Moscow without complaints, immersed in prayer, however, this is my personal opinion. It was not for nothing that I continued the quote to this last sentence, Maksimovich's version is only his private opinion. However, this opinion turned out to be a very convenient explanation for Russian propaganda, 
so convenient that it spread it as much as possible, so much so that even in Ukrainian schools after the restoration of our country's independence, this version was repeated. Maksimovich's point of view does not really stand up to any criticism, it was leveled by Pantelaymon Kulish, and criticized by many other contemporaries of Maksimovich. After all, up to 1618th year and after that, nothing prevented the Ukrainian Cossacks from fighting against Orthodox Moscovites many times, and to fight even in alliance with Catholic Poles, with Protestant Swedes or even with Muslims Crimean Tatars, this did not pose any problem for them at all. Well, as we will see later, Sahaya Dakni was against ending the war with Moscow. However, there are several other explanations. The first and most scientific explanation is simple banal military failure. The assault on Moscow was carried out by insufficient forces, respectively, the defenders of the city were able to repel him, and the entourage of King Vladislav began to put pressure on him to make peace with the Moscovites as soon as possible before the beginning of a cold and hungry winter. The second version is that Sahaya Dakni stopped the attack because he found out that the Poles refused to fulfill their obligations, the same ones they promised to the Cossacks before the start of the campaign. The third version, Sahaya Dakni stopped the attack because he did not want to excessively strengthen the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at the expense of the maximum weakening of Muscovy, because the Poles could once again start attacking the rights of the Ukrainian Cossacks and the Orthodox population. And, Finally, the fourth version is that Sahaya Dakni did not finish off Moscow because he actually hatched plans and preparations for a joint Moscow Cossack campaign against the Crimean Khanate. By the way, friends, which of these versions seems closest to the truth? Write your thoughts in the comments. Having retreated from Moscow, the Ukrainian Cossacks carried out a lightning and devastating raid on the cities of Sierpikov and Kaluga, capturing many prisoners. It is not for nothing that the Russians still call these events the Sahedokni Raid. In general, the entire complex of events in the fall of 1618 prompted the Muscovites to turn to Vladislav Vaza with a request for an armistice, but Sahaya Dakni did not like this prospect at all. And through Colonel Yusuf Pitovolts, he asked the king not to enter into peace negotiations with Muscovy, but these considerations were not taken into account. Vladislav was forced to make concessions to the nobility, the nobility demanded speedy reconciliation on the favorable terms that could be imposed on Muscovy, and as a result, on the 11th of December, 1618 year, an armistice was signed in the village of Dulino near Sargiev Posad, near Moscow. The conditions of this armistice were extremely difficult for the Moscow Kingdom, it lost, that is, it gave the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth the Chernihiv Seversk and Smolensk lands, which the Grand Duchy of Lithuania lost at the beginning of the 16th century. After that, the area of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth increased to approximately 1 million square kilometers. King Vladislav retained the right to be called the Tsar of Moscow. A Muscovite crown was made for him, very lavishly decorated with pearls, sapphires, emeralds and rubies. The truce was concluded for 14 years and 6 months. Looking ahead, I note that Muscovy violated the terms of the treaty, well, it is such a national tradition in them, and attacked the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth a year before the end of this period, but again suffered a heavy and very humiliating defeat, this time near Smolensk. After the Dulinsky truce, Sahaya Dakni Cossacks returned to Ukraine via Bolhov, Oral, and Kursk, Having covered 1,200 kilometers in three months, the Cossacks were stationed in the Kiev Voivodeship, and the Hetman's Regiment, directly in Kiev. For their participation in the Moscow campaign, the Cossacks received a monetary reward from the Polish government. And in the summer of 1619, Sigismund III issued a letter in which he thanked Sahaya Dakni and the Cossacks for a successful campaign. In October 1619 near the town of Pavalik, between Bielitz Serkva and Jatomir, the Rostavy Agreement was signed. According to which the number of registered Cossacks increased from 1,000 to 3,000, but this did not satisfy the interests of the Cossacks at all, because, as we know, their number according to some data was up to 40,000 people. The authority of Peter Sagayadekny after the end of the campaign grew infinitely, 
but the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth did not fulfill one of the most important obligations, it did not restore the Orthodox hierarchy, and as a result of this, Sagayadekni resorted to retaliatory actions. The same did not fulfill its obligations, and at the beginning of 1620th years, Sagayadekni sends Ambassador Peter Odenets to Moscow and offers the services of the Cossacks in military service. Just imagine, only a year and a half has passed since the end of the Moscow campaign. But military mercenary was an absolutely normal thing for those times, and one of the most important sources of income for Ukrainian Cossacks. Although it did not work out with Muscovy then, but the embassy of Peter Odenets fulfilled a very important task, it is assumed that it established contact with the Patriarch of Jerusalem Theophanes III, who was in Moscow. After that, the Patriarch came to Kiev and, having authority from the Patriarch of Constantinople Timofey II, restored the Orthodox hierarchy on the territory of the Kiev Galician metropolis, consecrating Job Beretsky as Metropolitan. But while the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was fighting against Muscovy, while Sahaya Dakni was preoccupied with church affairs, a new, much more serious threat, the Ottomans, was brewing in the south. Ahead will be that Setsorsk disaster, where the very young Bodin Komelnitsky was captured, and the famous Atin battle, where the Ukrainian Cossacks will again cover themselves with immortal glory, but this will be the last battle for Petro Sahayadakni. If you are interested in hearing a story about this, dear friends, write about it in the comments, do not forget to like it, share this video on social networks and subscribe to the channel History Without Myths, thank you for your attention, see you soon. Thank you.